Greetings, fellow Terrans. Admiral Samwise Didier here. I'm gonna take you on a tour through the bowels and the depths of the StarCraft II art team. You ready? I know you are. Now, the StarCraft art team is made up of three bullpens. The 5-4, the Ninjaloa Lounge, and Tiki Village. Each one is ruled over by an art lead who supervises a group of animators, modelers, texture artists, UI artists, concept artists, you get the idea, right? Now, we do have a few artists that operate autonomously from these bullpens. They're very dangerous. You should handle them with extreme care and caution. That's your only warning you get. Now, the StarCraft art team is one of the oldest teams here at Blizzard. It's also one of the smallest, consisting of about 15 artists, but five of them grizzled veterans from the original StarCraft. So when we were making art for StarCraft II, we didn't want to stray too far away from what the fans love, but we didn't want to rehash the same stuff we did 10 years ago. So we tried to stick to what we thought were the basic meat and potato units in the game. An example, when you think of Terrans, you think of Marines, siege tanks, battle cruisers, right? But everything else that's not the essential, they weren't so lucky. Poor Firebat. It's a good thing we made this big wall hanging poster. All right, well, I guess it's time to muster the crew and get down to some business. Go on. Well, one of the things we've really done in StarCraft II is we've made a, made a crazy graphics engine that requires uh, advanced shaders such as uh, normal mapping, parallax occlusion mapping, all these other high-end words I love to use, screen space ambient occlusion, I love those things. But uh, the whole point of it, though, is we've made a, the art uh, high-tech, yet very artified, and still very readable and playable. So the final result, especially when you're on a high-end machine, is a beautiful play experience. Basically for the, the proce art process, it's, it's pretty diverse, again, depending on what we're doing, what we're making. But in general cases, like if we're making a unit, we'll go through a concepting phase, we'll kind of jam, have like kind of blue sky ideas, just like, hey, you know, what about this, this, and we'll kind of get some ideas out there. We talk to Sammy about stuff, if we have ideas. He kind of reins us in and makes sure that like, this doesn't look Terran, or this is our stuff should be more, you know, X, Y, and Z. With everything we make, we're trying to make sure it like really fits into the universe. And like, for instance, I made, a, I made a wooden podium. It was like a tiny little project, two hours. And uh, I tried to squeeze it in, and then I got, I got feedback from a couple different artists saying, like, there isn't any wood anywhere in the game. You gotta, you know, you gotta shift it over to metal. And then <laughs> after I do that, it's like, well, they wouldn't use, they wouldn't use like, paper on the podium. They, they do, like, a little TV screen, or, you know, I'm like, they, they're, really, they're really into the, into the universe and what, what they would use, so. Yeah, I think we've been really lucky where we've had enough time to make everything up to a standard of quality where we're like, okay, that's good enough. If I never get to touch this again, I think I'll be happy with how that drone looks. So, but I mean, everything, even like the larva, we're like, let's make the perfect larva. And it's like a, a dumb three-segmented worm, but it's the best three-segmented dumb worm we've ever <laughs> built. We've even done it where we make the model and then we do a concept afterwards. Shh, you can't wear our secret. Secret, 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 secret. Sorry. Somebody like Sammy will just redraw it from like the model and like, hey, perfect. Awesome, just like, how we intended. For most of us, it's being a jack of all trades, being able to take stuff from nothing all the way to a final textured model, lit, ready to go in game. And then I give all my stuff to Jay, who makes it yeah. cool. <laughs> We're right across from each other, he's like, hey, if I model it this way, do you think we can get this thing to work like, like you know, and it's just like, yeah, how about we do this, you know, and then, then I can figure out a way, because I do a lot of the rigging and stuff like that, and he comes up with really cool models, and so I'm always looking at him like, how can I make this really interesting, you know, like, gross. How yeah, really gross. gross. <laughs> <laughs> Tentacles and sphincters and things. Sometimes, like, when we get the models, if they're revisions, what sometimes happens when we revise stuff is we'll tweak proportions, like, we need bigger shoulder pads on this guy, he needs to be taller, and the model we had will get really distorted, but it'll be what we want. And we'll say, okay, from here, let's make a, you know, nice final version with all those changes in mind. So what's really funny about StarCraft One was done in 3D first, and then rendered to uh, to individual images, touched up in a 2D software package, and made as sprites. So it's a 2D game. What's funny about it is our Marine now 
is, is 3D. It's made up of vertices and polygons the same way as the original StarCraft one was. But the original StarCraft one was the cinematic model. It was actually a million polygon marine. We cannot even get close to what exactly that was. But what's really funny is the million polygon marine, only eight pixels tall, is pretty ugly. So this time around though, our new marine, he's in the uh, about a 1500 polygon range. He actually has way more detail than the original StarCraft one uh, marine does. Yeah, you have to take in the the fact that they're very small, the unit's pretty small, and that you're seeing it from three-quarter view. And the colors have to be bright so that it reads. In the original StarCraft, like, because there's only 256 colors and only certain ranges for every race, I think a lot of people saw grittiness in there when it was actually just different pixels only being able to choose yeah. between four different <laughs> you colors. You get four browns. <laughs> uh, I think that the palette, basically, from StarCraft 1 to StarCraft 2, and we try to, you know, keep the whole vibe there and, and keep everything very familiar but it's a little more gritty than, than say like Warcraft 3. Yeah most of the Terrans are like blocky and mm -hmm. you know it's like utilitarian stuff that you'd find where they would mash something together to make something else if they needed it in you know in the field. Every unit we updated and stuff like that there's definitely that we have to get this right to a certain caliber because when people think of a marine this is what they think of yeah. and so there are always elements that had to carry over. And I think like Sammy had an awesome eye, like when we improved stuff like the Immortal from the Dragoon, in terms of, well, let's armor it up more and make it beefier, manlier. That's what we did. If you have a problem with those qualities, then you're not a man. <laughs> Everything we do, we're kind of looking back to StarCraft 1 and trying to think of you know, how does, how does this reflect on the original game and how, how much are we improving upon it? How much are we changing it? The artists will a lot of times get, get something in looking the way they want it to look and there's, there's constantly this evaluation from QA looking at the performance on each individual unit and each individual effect and it kind of comes back saying, hey, this one is, is uh, too fat, you know? And then the hard choices have to start being made of where's that balance, how, how much do we cut it down and can we still get it to look as good as they're trying to get it to look while performing well enough to, to support our goals for frame rate and stuff like that. So, yeah, there, I think we kind of, there's a lot of push and pull there. Some things are worth it where it's like, hey, like the nuke, it's got to be over the top. It's got to be cool if it's expensive. Then, you know, if we got an air on one side, you know, the, I don't care if the plant or like the little, you know, the bottom of the marine foot is as detailed as like the top of like the mothership or something really cool like that. So we kind of just kind of be smart about where the, we get bang for the buck at. I'd say if you, uh, wanted to get it in the business that you have to really enjoy, you know, doing, at least from an art part of view, like, like building models and creating things and drawing and stuff like that. If that's something that you really geek out on and you really love, then, um, you know, this is a good place for you. Basically just getting in there and learning the hardware, no matter if it's Maya or Max or, you know, Blender or whatever, and just get in there and trying to learn the, the, the basics of it. Because once you get that down, it doesn't matter what program you use, you, the, the fundamentals are all the same. Photoshop. Yeah. We, we do everything in Photoshop. <laughs> Everything's in Photoshop. <laughs> Photoshop. I don't know, you just gotta like, keep at it and keep wanting to improve yourself. And, you know, if you see something that's inspiring to you and awesome, try and figure out what makes that art cool and just Keep busting your ass until you're getting up to that same level of quality. And if you know someone else who's doing good art, and just ask them, you know, pick their brain and speak. Tell me what you know. If they don't tell you, tie them up. Drive out to a lake and ask them again. If they don't tell you. Hey everybody, my name is Matt Samia, and I head up the Blizzard Film Department. We make all the cool movies that you see as part of every Blizzard game. We're basically an all-CG animation studio, just like the folks that make any of your favorite movies. We're organized into teams who focus on different parts of the production, from the concepting, pre and storyboard guys at the beginning, all the way through modeling, animation, effects, lighting, and finally, the compositing team who output the final frames that you see on your screen. Star 2 was one of the most challenging projects we worked on this far and also one of the most rewarding. We had a chance to really stretch our storytelling in ways that we hadn't had a chance to in the past, especially with the in-engine flicks. And to tell you more about that, I'm going to pass it on to Nick Carpenter.
Hey, I'm Nick Carpenter and I am the Executive Art Director for Blizzard Entertainment and today I'm going to be giving you guys an inside look at our real-time cinematic creation process. So one of the things that we were really excited to do on this project were to take these pre-rendered assets and get them into the real-time environment. And it allowed us to tell stories in a way we just hadn't been able to do before. These assets are extremely large and really hard to deal with. And in the real-time environment, we were able to create these cinematics that lasted a much longer. And we were able to explore stories from a different angle and really dig out these situations. We were able to take these super high-res maps and meshes and extract that information and get it into the real-time environment. When we actually started seeing this stuff being rendered in real-time, we were super excited. So that pretty much wraps it up for me. I'm gonna pass it over to Jeff Chamberlain, who's gonna walk you guys through the cinematic creation process. Hello, I'm Jeff Chamberlain. I'm the cinematic project lead for StarCraft II. Uh, making the StarCraft II cinematics was an awesome experience. It allowed us to tell the game's story in the traditional Blizzard cinematics way. We started the process writing the story with the other teams to ensure that it fit their criteria. Um, we spent a great deal of time here because basically the story is the foundation for the cinematic process. Once the story was complete, we started working through the departments that Matt mentioned earlier to get to our final frames. Uh, this is an exciting time for our department. It's pretty much the bulk of our work. So in the meantime, we were working with the sound department to develop the scores and sound effects for the StarCraft II cinematics. Uh, once we were able to marry all that stuff together, we realized that what started out as a really ambitious project ended up being the very real StarCraft II cinematics that you have in front of you today. So let's hand it over to some of our team members to give you an in-depth look at this amazing process. My goal is to uh, help the directors to visualize the asset in 3D as fast as we can, so then uh, we cut all the back and forth between concept and modeling. One of the great examples of a, a, a character that has a really good and detailed displacement work is Kerrigan. Um, we had the concept done, uh, and the concept convey a great amount of detail, and then we, we, we build a, a base mesh that has all the right proportions and enough information to help us to add the detail on it. So when we started talking about StarCraft II and uh, I knew we would have to have a new design for the Marine, I started working with the concept artist back then and, and kind of exploring some ideas. So we came, we, we came up with something that the director was really happy with and uh, the, uh, the concept artist was able to take that to a completely different level. So 3D pre-production, uh, or the previs process, is the basics of creating the film for the first time in 3D. One of the main things to get out of a 3D pre-production is camera space and how the camera tells the story. Once the basics are there, you put into place, then we start assembling the scene. We start laying characters in and making a composition out of it. Um, you basically pose a character and you put it in the scene and when the composition is strong, then you can move on to animating and do a general animation and getting staging the main actions in there. We'll start gathering reference. Um, we'll even grab a camera and start filming ourselves in the parking lot or in our, in our desk or wherever we can and start planning the animation that way. Uh, film reference is something we use a lot and it helps us get through a lot of ideas and see what looks good on camera, what doesn't. We have the three main characters, Tychus, Raynor, and Kerrigan, all in the same space. And we needed to show an emotional battle between all three of them. We needed to show Raynor's longing for Kerrigan over all this time, and the finality of actually getting what he wanted. And we also needed to show the double cross between Tychus and Raynor. And we had to do this in these large metal suits. And so what we really relied on was these close, intimate shots of the facial expression. So we dug deeply into the acting, and we dug deeply into eye direction, speaking, getting a lot of the body language through the eyes, and getting a lot of the believability through the fleshiness of the face. Once you tell the story cleanly and clearly in 3D, then we can distribute all these individual assets and worry about adding more detail and adding more effects and more elements here or there. Rigging is the process um, of 
hooking up controls to our characters that allow the animators to move them through the scene. One of our more complex rigs that we built for the cinematics uh, was the armor suit for the Marine. You see them in the intro and all throughout the rest of the cinematics. There were many controls, over 200, um, to articulate everything from the arms moving around and the face shield down to all the little vents on the back and down the spine. Um, so that presented a unique and difficult challenge for us to keep that whole thing together and rigid and um, still able to act, still able to give the performance that the animator was looking for. So we have the simulation process, and that's, that's the process of deforming a character using a uh, simulator. So th the character of Kerrigan uh, presented a number of different challenges for us, uh, not the least of which is she's seen in three different forms uh, throughout the cinematics. So another, another simulation task that we're responsible for is the simulation of all the hair in all of the shows. So in Kerrigan's Dream, for instance, you see uh, Kerrigan running around, wind blowing around, dust blowing around. That presented some challenges for us because we really needed to work closely with the effects team and the animators to make sure that the continuity was there, the wind directions were all correct. Um, her hair was blowing in the same direction as all the dust elements and, and ember elements and fire elements that were provided by the effects team. When you're lighting a sequence, uh, about half the equation is the lights and the other half is the shaders and how the, how the, the surfaces react to the lights. As the shaders are being developed, um, the artist is looking at real world samples of different materials and trying to mimic that in CG and how, how shiny the object is, how reflective it is, what coloration it has, um, just how it takes light in every way. So there was a lot of a lot of effects elements uh, that we were going to be, we knew we had to create that we didn't know exactly what they needed to look like. We had an idea. You can kind of imagine what what uh, low lying fog would look like, for example, but without actually seeing it in action, you don't you don't get the nuances that make it that sell it as being realistic. So one of the things that we did was we uh, rented out a studio and we went and we shot, uh, you know, practical effects basically. Uh, we shot, for example, dry ice uh, pouring out of buckets and falling over the floor and uh, took, you know, looked at it from many different camera angles to try to see what happens when it, when it interacts with objects and moves around the objects. It was pretty fun. We got to do lots of things with like air cannons shooting through the, the ice to see what would happen when a character would walk through a foggy, a foggy ground and how it would swirl around his feet. Uh, we also shot reference for doing uh, dust, like heavy, heavy blowing dust in the air, where we took bags of flour and shook them in front of a fan and watched it go through the air. That was, that was great fun. So compositing is a process that we use quite heavily here, and it allows us to uh, really fine tune the look of our, of our shots in a fairly interactive way. Um, when you're rendering Traditionally, rendering 3D objects, it can take hours and hours and hours to produce a frame. What we found really useful, and we use this quite a bit, is we render everything out to multiple render passes. We, we basically split the lighting information from the surface information, and we will render out, in some cases, hundreds of different layers that we'll then bring in to our compositing package and reassemble. And when we reassemble it, that allows us to actually have fairly detailed control over each aspect of the lighting and the, sh and the shader itself, how, how it reacts. Um, we'll separate characters from environments and props from characters and effects and everything and put it all back together. And it really gives us this exploded view of our whole scene that allows us to, to go into any area, focus on it, and change the look of it slightly. And so the real challenge is to pull it all together at the end and make it look like it was all rendered at once. and and that every, every frame of our cinematic looks as good as it can. It looks like a painting, essentially. So story mode is basically the single player campaign of StarCraft II. And uh, cinematics part of it is to basically tell the story through story mode in the game. So what I'm gonna show you here is basically an overview of one of the characters in the game, Jim Rayner. And uh, it takes place in Marsarabar, which is the start of the game. 
and that's where you, we first introduced Gym Raider to you, which is four years after the original StarCraft. Um, over here, we can go over to basically a gener general model of Gym Raider, which is basically just modeled, and uh, we usually start off with a concept art for Gym Raider, and then through that, build a model, and then go on to texturing. He is pretty much finished the model of everything we have, and uh, after we apply all the UVs and, and uh, do all the cool stuff for that, we also finish the texturing on, on Jim Rayner and put him straight into the game. Here Jim Rayner is in the game, fully lit and textured already. We make all of our own assets. We don't actually reuse game assets. We looked at that very early on. Uh, it would have been great if we could have. The problem is all the game assets were designed to be viewed from this, this god view where you're looking down from you know, anywhere from a couple of miles up. And so they're all designed to be looked at from that angle, which means colors have to be exaggerated. Uh, you can't have a lot of complex detail because it just turns into a noise when you're far away. Whereas we wanted to be really close to these characters. We wanted to be able to do close up, tightly framed character shots, see the expressions on their face, see every detail. So for all of our assets, we started from scratch. We took their designs for the game assets, if we're gonna be reusing the style of them or, or the actual unit, uh, and we went in, we did new concepts to try to add a lot more detail, figure out what they would look at from different angles that you might never see them at in the game, uh, and then sculpted them all out. So we had to come up with a lot of solutions to build a whole new pipeline. Uh, we had to figure out how can we work in individual shot files, get all of our characters in there, get them animating together, and then save out all that animation data, put it all back together later and get it into the game engine. So thanks for hanging out and checking out the cinematic creation process, and we hope you guys enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys on Battle.net real soon. My name is Dustin Browder. I'm the lead designer on StarCraft II, and I'm going to take you for a short tour today of the StarCraft II design area. Now, the StarCraft II team has all gathered around this one office. This is Bunker 5-5. And this is the heart and soul of the design team. This is where a lot of the levels get made and this is where a lot of the great ideas that go into the multiplayer experience are crafted. Bunker 5-5 is also well prepared in case of the inevitable zombie apocalypse. The StarCraft II team is made up of veterans of the original StarCraft, of StarCraft Brood War, of Warcraft III, and the Frozen Throne. In addition, we've hired a lot of new talent to help us finish this massive game. Designing StarCraft II is the biggest challenge this team has ever faced. We understand that fan expectations for this game are off the charts. We have to recapture the essence and the excellence of the original StarCraft, and at the same time, add all new ideas that have been developed by our team or by the fans over the last 11 years. We have spent years working on the multiplayer game. We have spent years working on the campaign game. And it is an effort that we are proud to stand behind and present to the world. Now that you've seen some of our area, let's go talk to some of the people that actually make the game happen. The way that uh, game design kind of works here at Blizzard is it's very collaborative. You know, it's really the, the job of the design team to pull the best ideas out of the overall development team. So a lot of times I think people get this perspective that the game designers just sit in a room and come up with these ideas. And in reality, the way it really works is the game development team comes up with ideas, be it, you know, associate artist or a senior programmer or anybody on the team. The ideas kind of really come from everywhere. And the game designers are really the ones that kind of take those ideas and figure out, do they fit within the vision of the game and how to turn them into great gameplay and really fun game mechanics. Yeah, well, one of the cool things in, in making StarCraft 2 is, um, you know, basically as far as the engine goes and rendering, we started from the ground up. So as opposed to taking the Warcraft 3 engine, as opposed to taking, you know, obviously something from 1998, we started from the ground up, built the entire engine uh, specifically for StarCraft 2. The level designers that I work with, their job is basically just, um, they take the story of what we want to do and as far as the entire story arc, break it down into small little bits. And from there, we plan each mission of how we're gonna sell that story. 
Each mission in the StarCraft II campaign, we really try to make sure it has its own kind of unique gameplay hook. You know, we kind of jokingly refer to it as a gimmick, but you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a gimmick sort of map or anything like that, but we, but we just want to make sure that, that every mission has its own kind of fun puzzle element to it or, or kind of fun different twist to it. So we might have a mission that you know, as a survival mission where you have to hold out for 30 minutes. Or we might have a mission where, you know, you have to go down onto low ground and quickly mine a bunch of minerals, and then every so often lava will actually come up and destroy all your units that are on low ground unless you, you get out of the mission. When we moved into this project, we played a lot of StarCraft and a lot of Brood War, looked at the missions, looked at how we told the story, um, how we introduced the units through the campaign. And we really just kind of started with there. What was fun about the game and what did we think we could improve on and what's new we could add to the game. We have a strong desire to make things new and to try new and interesting things. At the same time, there's a, a lot of people who want uh, the part of StarCraft they remember to remain the same. That's one challenge in and of itself is to make sure that, you know, we're being respectful of lore, we're carrying through the gameplay and, and making sure that it's a a good entry level game for a first experience and then also making sure that it's a skill based game all the way up to the highest level that we have esports and you can compete with it and you can watch it as a spectator and, and have a, a really enjoyable experience as well. So yeah, it's it's a lot of work actually integrating the story mode uh, campaign experience into the missions themselves. Um, a lot of the the missions rely a lot on the story that's going on. At the same time, the story relies on what's going on in the missions. If we can't develop a fun mechanic around what's going on in the story, we have to change the story. So yeah, as a designer, our job is to kind of make the game fun. So we get all of the, the cool features that the programmers make, and we find awesome ways to twist them and make them into something uh, fun to play with. Uh, fun mission, I, I think the player is just very clear of what they need to be doing and they have certain challenges or obstacles that they have to overcome and the player feels smart about how they go about beating the mission. Um, if we make it too narrow or too defined for the player that this is how you do it, that's not as fun because then it feels like the player hasn't done anything. So, you know, I'll get it to a point where I think it's fun and it works for my play style, and then someone else will sit down at the map and they have a completely different play style. So we have to get that person's opinion too, you know? And, you know, is it fun for the turtle guy? Is it fun for the rush guy? And we've got to kind of find that balance between the two. And then we just play test it a bunch and we iterate over everything. If we don't like something, then we, we improve it or we take it out and try something else. So that's the nice thing is because, you know, we've got a lot of talented designers here. Um, we all get together and kind of riff on a map instead of one person just going through making the map and then, you know, beating it to heck in the end. We're all kind of collaborative throughout the process. So, you know, I'll think of an idea and I'll be like, hey, Huck, what do you think of this idea? And he'll say, dude, that sucks, but it would be cool if you did this. And so we'll you know, kind of riff on those ideas and get them in the game, polish them up. StarCraft was uh, one of the first games, I think, that uh, was very successful in esports. You know, it was kind of surprising, I think, when you go back, I don't know, let's say 15 years even before StarCraft and starting to see, you know, professional gamers that would play games like Quake and would earn money actually playing that game. And when StarCraft rolled around, I think it took it really to the next level, especially overseas in Korea. So with StarCraft II, we knew we really had to make sure that we supported that community. And, and we really have taken our time with the multiplayer and with the game balance to make sure that when you make a game that's really gonna be considered almost baseball 2.0, you know, we really wanna make sure that it lives up to that legacy. Multiplayer was a really, really huge aspect of StarCraft One. If anything, I would actually probably say that it's the, the biggest aspect of um, StarCraft One. And trying to take that success and transfer into StarCraft Two, you know, obviously first and foremost, we need to make sure that gameplay is there. That we have the core mechanics of StarCraft One, of you know, resourcing, of making units, of queuing, and having a food cap, and all those small intricacies of having micromanagement and also having you know, micro macro management. And the fact that those two kind of conflict and you need to choose, you know, you have, to explain that a little bit, you have, you know, a thousand different things you could be doing in any given second and you only have the mental capacity to do about 500 of them. 
and um, you know, to always have the ability to choose of what you want to do. So we're having a bit of a hydralisk balance problem today. Um, we don't see them being made too often in our matches and they're not very good when you use them. Yeah, so we, we first ident identify the problems and um, we try to find the best possible solutions to them. And once we have, then we would play, play some games, make sure they're the best solutions, and if they're not, then we would uh, restart that process all over again. We try to make like a, as realistic a situation as possible every time we try to balance test any new, new units or changes. So I'm just doing the basic uh, build order that a Protoss player will be doing. Um, basically, the problem with the Hydralis was mainly against the Protoss race, so we're going to see if we've alleviated some of the, I guess, problem with the Hydralis being not so useful. Um, in an actual game situation. For the first test, it seems pretty good, but um, we'll probably tweak some more things, uh, play some more times, and then decide what we're gonna do. We also usually involve uh, some of the other designers, um, get their opinions on things, but um, yeah, it's pretty much we, uh, if we find a problem, we'll try to identify it and then um, figure out some fixes and play fit and see if it feels any better. Yeah, so the, the team that I work with is uh, the team of designers, you know, like I mentioned, we have the balance designers and their job is predominantly just making sure that we have a balanced game. Um, well, I guess that's <laughs> pretty obvious, balance designers uh, balance, but their, their job is just to make sure that, um, to crunch the numbers, to make sure that we have three separate factions that are very distinctive, um, but also balanced as well. Keeping units interesting and unique is tricky especially with three races that are completely different. There are certain mechanics that we actually try not to bleed over into different races. We try and focus on one race to help give that race a certain identity. So in StarCraft II, we definitely make sure that we have those dynamics. Um, but beyond that, you know, we're bringing you new units. Uh, we're taking out some of the older units in StarCraft I that either the roles were a little bit soft or that they weren't used as much and trying to bring some really interesting and cool dynamics. Um, for instance, like a Stalker, it's a, a basic mechanical unit that can shoot ground, it can shoot air, however, it now has the versatility of a blink ability that gives it a short range teleport. So you can use it kind of offensively in chasing units, you can use it defensively in jumping across chasms, or um, you know, even if you have vision up a cliff, you can use your guys to, to bypass someone's entire choke and just move up a cliff and then you can move around the backside and then surprise them. So there's some really, really cool dynamics. We're very proud of the work we've done and we think we've come a long way from the original days when we were first releasing and talking about this game in Korea in 2007. And we think we've really hit a really exceptional experience uh, and hopefully the fans will agree. Um, when it comes to story mode, when it comes to the campaign, we've got some very unique missions, some very intense storylines, a lot of very exciting moments for these characters and some really epic battles all over you know, Dominion space, all over the Kapula sector, which will hopefully sort of show StarCraft players a vision of the StarCraft universe they've never really seen before. On the multiplayer side, we think we've made a lot of great steps to create an experience that not only harkens to the legacy of the original StarCraft, but also creates a lot of new tactics and a lot of new strategies will hopefully challenge players you know, just for years and years to come. Oh, hello. Uh, my name's Andy Chambers. I'm the lead writer here on StarCraft II. Uh, the writers on the computer game work with the designers and the artists to produce characters, missions, plots, dialogue, a whole enchilada that hopefully will be uh, enthralling enough to keep you playing right through to the end. So we're going to talk about StarCraft II's story for a while now. Now, if you haven't already finished the game, you might want to skip this bit for now, because there's bound to be spoilers, and we don't want to give anything away. So. Off you go. Oh, you're still here? Good. Okay. Congratulations on your stunning victory. So, StarCraft II. Well, as the name cunningly implies, there was a StarCraft I. And an expansion for it called Brood War. Now, the memorable thing about these first games was the characters involved. The conflicts between them. It was life, death. Revenge, betrayal, insurrection. All in all, there's a hell of a lot going on. So, StarCraft II, I had lots to play with. 
between Arcturus Manx, Sarah Kerrigan, and Jim Rayner. There's a whole barrel load of unresolved conflict floating around. And that's before we even got on to adding the new plots and new characters we wanted to put in for StarCraft II. So, on balance, we decided to start with the man with the biggest story to tell, Jim Rayner. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let's hear from the others for a bit. Uh, the transition from StarCraft I to StarCraft II um, on a number of levels has been uh, quite an adventure. If you can say there's really great bits in StarCraft I, I, I think um, many of them we kind of stumbled into. Um, I remember writing the game with uh, our designer at the time, James Finney, um, and a lot of the beats that we found to be most memorable, you know, after the fact were, you know, really um, not mistakes, but things that just kind of popped up. They weren't part of this overarching vision right from the get-go. Um, I think a lot of that storyline really kind of just coalesced over time as the as the game mechanics got clearer, as the mission concepts got, uh, you know, more defined um, as we were able, able to play, you know, on certain of the maps. Um, I think certain characters started coming foreground. You know, once we finished Warcraft 3, which um, was a very different take on how to do an RTS story, you know, we kind of learned through the use of heroes that people could get really connected with their characters. Well, story mode was a whole new thing for us for StarCraft II to give us a place where we could really get in behind these characters and really see what was going on. If you look at sort of the history of real-time strategy games across Blizzard, right, it's really an evolution of what has come before. This is kind of what this team has always wanted to do, but never really had the time or the technology to really make it happen. And then as we were developing the campaign, you know, the, the Terran campaign alone, just from what the story wanted to be, got bigger and bigger and bigger. StarCraft, I think, has always really been about specific characters, right? At the heart of this thing with these, you know, giant alien empires, you know, crashing against each other. It's really about a boy and a girl at the end of the day. For the kind of geeks that we are, you know, we're usually much more comfortable dealing with, you know, giant spaceships and alien invasions and you know, ancient artifacts coming back to haunt the present. Um, you know, that's much more in the realm of comfort for, for most of us as designers and writers. Um, but this time around, um, these characters demanded to be foreground. The, the complex web of, you know, how they relate to each other um, and how their simple movements as individual people really resonate throughout this, you know, bigger universe. You know, these big, you know, galactic conflicts. You know, at, this, at the center of it all is essentially this very simple love story, you know. Um, who would have thought that? So we had to take a look at the story and really kind of pepper it with these emotions versus completely uh, being front-loaded. So what we've done is really try to find a balance between who, the, who your hero is, having a lot of fun and wanting to play as Jim Rayner versus these huge emotional arcs that he's going through, right? But we had to take liberties and kind of step back a little bit and make sure that the player understood that he was somebody worth investing into. And that was the challenge, you know, um, and I think that's also the challenge with telling a story with inside the confines of a video game. Uh, at the start of this game, Jim Rayner is a, is a man haunted by his, his, uh, the demons of his past. He, um, you know, he's battling with uh, all the betrayals that he's suffered and all the things that he's lost. Um, and he's, he's trying to lead this, this, this crazy guerrilla uh, rebellion and at the same time, stay as a, a functional human being just because he's, he's dealing with, you know, obviously uh, uh, the terrible tragedy of, of not just losing the woman that he cared about uh, in Sarah Kerrigan, but with, with what happened to her subsequently where she, she became the, <laughs> the most evil force in the galaxy. I don't, think, I don't think there's a therapist out there that could help Rainer. <laughs> and this actually plays out through the whole campaign. His whole crew it gets into a space where they feel like it's mutiny. You know, I mean, this is insane. This this man that's, you know, uh, the captain of this huge starship feels compelled to chase down the most evil creature in the universe. And everyone sort of treats Kerrigan like a sleeping dragon at this point. No one, no one's gonna send expeditions off to worlds that she controls. No one's gonna to, to try to poke her. You know, Jim hasn't completely given up on the idea that you know there can be a better tomorrow, um, but he's so haunted by his ghost, pardon the pun, um, and the specter of Kerrigan and her betrayal, and you know the betrayal it makes that um, Jim's not as simple a character as he used to be. Well, the challenge for any epic storyline, right, is how you marry the huge 
sprawling battles or political intrigue or whatever it is, and then how do you sort of relate that down to the individual, right? That's what makes an epic feel really mighty. You still have to connect with an, a single other human being or a group of human beings or whatever, right? Or maybe aliens in Kerrigan's case, right? But you have to connect with people, right? But at the same time, you want to show them with a backdrop of just mighty empires clashing that ultimately either they're shaping the empires or the empires are shaping them. And so really that's what story mode and the game do together is they try to mesh together and create a holistic experience where you see what the cost is for a man like Raynor, right? When something happens, if a colony world is destroyed, he didn't save everybody. You can see that cost in the story mode experience, but then you obviously experience the battle in the actual game. I think it's safe to say that the Zerg are not gonna sit on their planets and, and just, just be happy and roast marshmallows or whatever they do. Um, they're, they're gonna come boiling off of those worlds and uh, um, there's going to be a lot of a, a lot of fighting, a lot of destruction, and the, the Koprulu sector is going to explode. What's been cool about StarCraft II is that it's so big, right? And it involves so many departments within Blizzard itself that really this time, um, it's really been uh, just a massive team effort. It was really cool to just kind of draw upon you know, more passionate creative minds and really um, come together as a group to conceptualize this storyline, you know, to, to, to write and storyboard the cinematics, to, you know, to, you know, take these characters that existed 10 years ago and update them for, you know, a gaming culture that's, you know, a lot more sophisticated these days than, than we were 10 years ago. Um, to see the art teams from the development standpoint and the cinematics, you know, uh, group, you know, really kind of come together and, you know, kind of co-own the visual development of the universe. Um, I think it's been a really good process for Blizzard overall. You know, I definitely feel like all of our efforts have just uh, produced something that's far more than um, any of our unique skill sets could have achieved. All right, here we are now in the programming area. We actually break up the programming department into two different disciplines. We call it engine and game. The teams are both overseen by some seasoned veterans. We have Carl Chimes, who's the lead engine programmer. He's been with the company for over nine years. And then we have lead game programmer, Bob Fitch, who's been with the company for over 17 years and worked on all the classics. I'm gonna turn it over to them to give some insight into the programming teams themselves. There's a lot of back-end work that you don't see uh, in the final game on the tool side of things. Like our whole build pipeline, we have servers dedicated to building the game and servers dedicated to testing the game and making sure that we get reports if anything breaks at any time. Uh, how many models, how many missiles you got, how much each costs, how many polygons, how many lights, how heavy is each light, how many shadows do they cast, and everywhere we try to make it so there's no... It has to be pretty smooth so there's no one part of it that's going to bring the whole system down. Okay, so this test tests a small battle in the game. And at the beginning of the battle we can see that this long line here shows how much time is spent searching for other units. So all these units are coming together and they're searching for an enemy to attack. So we, could, so we kind of expect that to take the most amount of time in the game. And as the, as the units come together, you can see that that bar shrinks dramatically and then uh, time is dominated by units uh, using their abilities and attacking. And during the battle, bars are just going off all over the places. <laughs> so it really takes a... Uh, you know, a lot of runs of this to really get an idea of what's taking the time on a dynamic basis. The designers are going to want thousands of units on the map at one time and all these crazy effects going off, so we just gear the tech towards that. We have a lot of graphic options where you can tweak things so that if things don't run well, you have the option as the user to actually tone things down. There's a lot of collaboration between the different teams. Um, like, designers talk mainly to the game programmers um, and they tell them what their ideas are and the game, game programmers make that happen. The artists talk a lot with the engine programmers um, and so we have to add features to, to accommodate their needs. Um, and then of course the artists and the designers talk a lot when they iterate on the, the, cinema, uh, the campaign missions and, and the in-game units. I've written the AI for all of the games that we've done. I worked on Warcraft 1, Warcraft 2, Starcraft, all of the AI for all of them. And each time we've gotten a chance to make it a little bit better than the last time. And this time is the first time that the AI doesn't cheat. It doesn't see what you have anymore until it goes out and it scouts you. And it does that by taking a unit like a peon 
and sending it around the map to different places and looking for the player to find where is the player, what do I see that the player has, um, where is it positioned, and all of that information it remembers, but it doesn't know anything other than what it has seen. And the second way is through the actions per minute by limiting how quickly it can execute the orders. If it wants to do something, then we put it into a queue of these are all the things that I would like to do right now. And we choose the one thing that is the most important of all the things that it thinks it would like to do. And then each time it's given a little opportunity to think, it goes, okay, now of all the things I could possibly do, which is the one that I want to do right now that's the most important? And it does that one. It's totally different from the way StarCraft I was because before we would think of all the things we want to do and then just do them. And it didn't have any limitations whatsoever. Uh, when compared to Warcraft 3, the basically we tried to make everything exposed in the editor. In Warcraft 3, we went as far as we could, but there were certain inherent limitations with the engine. And with StarCraft 2, it was designed from the ground up. The whole database system, the trigger system, everything was designed with the idea of allowing end users to modify it through the editor. Once we put the editor in the hands of the designers, they can do whatever they want, and they don't need us anymore to make decisions about what they're doing in story mode. It does everything they need. They could write the next expansions in the editor we already have. Well, one thing that I'm really happy with that we've developed is um, the recording system, the video recording system in-game that I'm excited to see what the Machinima community is going to do with. Um, these are the tools that we use for all of our in-game videos that you'll see in our newscasts and our tech purchase panels. Uh, what it allows designers to do is via our triggers, they set up the cutscene however they want and then they can set uh, movie recording triggers. When it runs the cutscene, it automatically records video snippets for you, uh, throws them all into a directory and you've got a movie. We have this uh, mod system now where you can actually publish your mods and your maps to Battle.net. That, that was a big thing and that's, that's integrated through the editor so you actually will use the editor to, to publish your maps to Battle.net. Every couple of Fridays, uh, we'll get a cu couple beers, um, get some snacks and some chips or whatever, and go into our Uber lounge over here, and we watch two balance designers on the big screen duke, duke, duke it out. Uh, we have Dustin doing the, um, the shout casting, and we're cheering, and you know, just sitting back and really enjoying the game. No, I don't play with the balanced designers. Anytime we try to play with the designers, I fail miserably. We have um, special programmer games uh, that we play every now and then. It'll be a 2v2 or 3v3 programmers only, and it's literally just zerglings and zealots running at each other, and you know, you never see any spellcasters, or you know, it's 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 a lot of fun, but it's a very different game experience than our uh, top-level designers play. There's no detail that's too small for us to look at it. There's no bug. Almost no bug that's too small for us to, to to deal with it, you know. So to me, that's very satisfying to actually know that we're going to go the extra mile and that we're going to fix everything until it's as close to perfect as possible. The next stop on your tour is right here in the Blizzard Entertainment Sound Department. I'm Russell Brower, and I'm the director of this fine establishment. I'm also one of the composers. We consider ourselves primarily storytellers here, and we spin our tales with music, dialogue, and sound effects, all of which are hopefully as unique as our virtual worlds themselves. Well, in terms of the music for StarCraft II, uh, we generally divided it up along the lines of the different races. So Glenn Stafford worked on primarily the Terran music, Derek Duke did the Zerg music, and I did the Protoss music. Well, big surprise, I'm uh, doing the Terran music again. I just got back from New York uh, recording with a uh, live band. And we went to Woodstock, New York, and did this session in an old church that's been turned some 25 years ago into a recording studio. Beautiful reverberant space, lots of wood surfaces, very um, just kind of vintage sounding, kind of an old rock and roll sound. And the, the, everything from the mixing board to the microphones, all of it was designed to have a sound that you, you associate with uh, older records and, 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 and just kind of an old rock and roll sound. It definitely has a raw 
cowboy edge to it, you know, holding true to the Terran sound from StarCraft One, but really taking it way beyond the production quality and what went into the original tracks. Uh, we can, but we missed, yeah, we didn't get the accent at 27. These musicians are people who have played with uh, just the most legendary musicians on the planet. They're, uh, they're studio people, they've played with a lot of our heroes and people we admire. We brought them all in one space and they uh, brought a level of musicianship and, and musicality to, to these songs that is just amazing. That'll represent the, a good portion, anyway, of the Terran music that you hear, at least in, in multiplayer mode and uh, in the single player missions when you're just building up troops and things like that. Getting a chance to work on the Zerg music again after all these years is, is fantastic. It's a big shift of gears going from World of Warcraft uh, into Zerg, but it's fantastic. The music has a different kind of energy. Basically, when I'm working on the Zerg music, I almost always have the lights turned low. I definitely look at the artwork quite a bit. For a while I had my digital picture frame full of just concept art, which upset my family quite a bit when they walked in and saw the mutilists and hydralists cycling through the, the present they had given to me. It usually starts with uh, creepy drones and low sounds, and there's always elements of noise to me that speak of the the Zerg, you know, little creepy crawly sort of textures and maybe there's weird high, you know, whining sounds and stuff like that that sort of create us like the Zerg family space. And then you have the, there's always usually a heavy bass drum that comes in at some point and it's usually delayed because it's in space. <laughs> From the very beginning of the project, I put drawings, concept art, backgrounds, settings, whatever I could find from either uh, the, the, the game development group or the cinematics group of the Protoss and their, their ships and, and everything that I could find. I put it on the walls and studied them, and I let that imagery sink in over time. So while I'm writing music, even if it's for something else, I'm kind of soaking all that in, and uh, it comes out eventually in what I write. Their soundscape is... Uh, is a layering of, of mystical whisperings and it's kind of musical hieroglyphs, if you will. And I try to infuse those kind of sounds with um, fairly traditional orchestral melodic sounds for emotion and then um, some textures created through synthesizers or sound design that bring a, a level of magic or just ethereal otherworldliness to it. One way we differentiated the soundscape in its uh, feeling and emotion from our other work, uh, being World of Warcraft or Diablo, is we took our orchestral recordings to a completely different orchestra and a different stage. And uh, so we went to Skywalker Sound up in Marin County on the legendary Skywalker Ranch. And there we got a more traditional film score type of sound to the room, uh, the players, uh, in the ensemble were, were playing in a way that was just, it felt more like a film score rather than uh, the more kind of uh, primitive sound we've been going for in World of Warcraft. Whereas Starcraft is a little more space fantasy and uh, the melodies are a little more intricate, the rhythms are, are more intricate and uh, it's just a different sound. I think the StarCraft II universe in all of our minds really does exist out there somewhere. And from my end of it, handling the dialogue, it's imperative that we found the, the perfect voices that really brought our Tychus and our Clotworthy and our, and our Kerrigans to life. The galaxy will burn with their coming. Casting for voiceover actors goes through several rounds. 
Um, the first is to kind of cast your net wide and far, and that requires myself and our team going through hundreds of auditions, listening for that, for that one thing that that somehow channels your character. And then from that it goes through our different development teams. And then we have the callbacks where we bring the actors in person into the studio and work with a talented voiceover director to kind of direct them more into our role. Voice overacting is very interesting. Even when I started, um, I thought, oh, it's so easy. You just get in front of the mic and you read the lines. And after working in voiceover as long as I have, it's such an art. Um, movie actors and TV actors can rely on their body language to convey emotions and to kind of, you know, emote what the character's going through, whereby a, a, a truly talented voiceover actor who only can use their voice to convey deep emotion or anger or rage is, is so challenging and people tend to think, oh, it's so easy, we can use anybody, but really, when you get a good voiceover actor in there, there's been many times I've been in the booth and we're silent because we're drawn into the scene because the actor's so good and just through their voice, we're there with them, living what they're living and seeing what they're seeing. Where we really get to have a lot of fun is with the piss lines. That's, that's what we call them, the piss lines, and that comes from Warcraft, where you clicked on a, a unit several times and eventually that unit would get pissed off and start saying nasty things to you. <laughs> Thor was, was a really fun character. Uh, one of the avenues that we wanted to pursue with the Thor unit was a certain accent that most people will find very familiar. It's over, you idiots! We brought the actor in and he absolutely nailed it. I mean, it sounded like Arnie in the booth. And, and he knew all the pop culture references and everything else that we used, and we used a bunch of them. And uh, it was just a blast. Why would I bring a chicken and sour cream into the office? Well, that was, well, it's the Zerg, right? I mean, it's some squishy, gross thing. And so originally, I think the idea was I wanted sound for the creep. You experiment. You don't know that it's going to turn out the way that you want it to turn out. I'm creating source material for uh, stuff that I know may not be for something specific, but will suit purposes for the race as a whole as I see it. So, you know, I created GAC, I created slime, I created, I used liquid soap, but I couldn't get the pina colada smell off my hands for days. I had just Excuse gotten back from the restroom and I was noticing how it has had this sound when I was rinsing my hands and so I said we ought to try and see if we can get some of the liquid soap. You're just trying a bunch of different stuff and you never really know what's going to come out until you throw it in the session and you listen to it out of context and you start going, oh wow, that's a cool sounding thing. This is a cool sounding thing. Largely, it's all improvisational and you really don't know what's going to happen. Is it like that totally sounds like a creature right yeah, there. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it just sounds like some freaky alien creature. I was originally listening to these liquid soap files, and we had the door open here, and Paul was in here, and Glenn was in here, and we're listening to them. And Chris Metzen walked by, then he comes back and sticks his head, and he's all, did you just mic the upstairs bathroom? Gack. <laughs> Take one. I don't see really any difference between what I do and what a composer does, to be honest. I, it's just different music. You know, and you listen to it a little bit differently. It doesn't have a snappy beat to it or whatever, but, you know, so you're setting, it's all the same things that a composer would try to do, tension and emotion and environment and space and s telling a story somehow of, you know, giving some background as to what a unit might sound like or what this planet that you're on that you're supposed to, you know, go spelunking for some godforsaking artifact or something, you got to create that, that world and make it seem real. So it could be a laser, or, a, or another laser, or a shark with a laser. <laughs> we have had a lot of fun working on StarCraft. From the early days of StarCraft I, when Glenn and his team first defined the sounds of a new universe, to our current group of dedicated sound designers, composers, and producers, we've had an amazing time 
working on StarCraft II. So from all of us at Blizzard Sound, log into Battle.net, turn up the volume, and enjoy.